Okay. Um, so uh, my name is Catherine O'Sullivan. Um, I'm a professor in civil engineering um, and I've connected into the TYC because I do quite a lot of modeling work. I'm giving quite a general introduction to a couple of my current research projects because I think it's quite far um, from what most of you do. Um, but, you know, I think there is scope for collaboration. I already um, collaborate with uh, Stefano Angoletti Uberti and Paul Tangney in materials looking at molecular dynamic simulations. So, um, at Imperial College, um, historically, um, there's a very, very strong geotechnics group that does fundamental research into the mechanical behavior of soil. So what we're really looking at is soil, which is a granular material or a discrete material, um, and how it behaves when it's loaded or deformations are applied to it. So for example, some of the tests done in this lab would have informed some of the insight into um, things like the Crossrail project and tunneling um, in central London. Obviously there are commercial labs as well, um, but there was some, some, some tests done in our lab related to that project just to gain more insight into London clay. So it's quite um, aligned with an application in the area of construction. Um, um, and what we do when we look at the soil is we decide what the soil type is based on the particle size. So um, if we look at clay, what we would define it in the first instance as a clay is a material where the, the grains are smaller than about two microns. And I should say as well that we're looking at, in our, we're not looking at organic soil, we're looking at, 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 at geological materials. So when we're looking at materials that are that small, obviously the ratio of the surface area to the volume is large and the surface charge has a big influence on behavior. Um, and that's, this is an image of kaolinite, which is uh, kind of a commonly considered laboratory clay. And these are some photographs of um, an, exper an experimental session I ran with my first year students probably about 10 years ago when I used to teach this class. And some of the tests we do in in soil mechanics to identify mineralogy, just really look at the consistency of the material at different water contents. And through these very simple tests, which were actually developed um, by soil scientists for agricultural applications, um, they're now used routinely in civil engineering as a means to identify um, the mineralogy to some extent, but to a greater extent, the type of behavior you might anticipate. Um, and what we ha have been trying to do in some of my research is look at using molecular dynamics to better understand the fundamentals of clay behavior. And I just put, brought these pictures in just to give you an indication of the kind of challenges um, that we have when we're talking about clay. So these are some data from a construction site at Athlone in Ireland. And what you see here is an embankment for a road being, a material is being progressively added to it. Um, starting in 1996 and, and, and going forward. And you're looking at 10 meters of fill to make a road embankment. And this is over, over a clay material. And what you see is the settlements are huge. They're nearly three meters, but also that they evolve progressively with time. So this is a very tricky kind of scenario to work with in terms of engineering design. You have a natural material, very large strains, and things happen with time. This is another issue um, that's particularly um, problematic in Scandinavia, and this is this idea of quick clays. So a clay slope can look like it's very stable, but under certain conditions, the clay can lose all its strength and you can get quite serious landslides that can involve and have involved fatal fatalities in some <coughs> cases. And then this is looking at the, the London Basin, the um, geological, map, a form of a geological map of London. Um, what you're seeing here in the blue shading is the potential to have a shrink swell behavior. So when the moisture content of the clay changes, that you can get quite large uh, deformations and they can cause damage to buildings. So this is quite, um, this is something that engineers are keeping an eye on in, in geotechnics because this may become more of an issue with climate change. Um, and somehow this, this little figure has stayed on. 
So my, my current research into clay involves um, a PhD student called Sarah Bandera. She's funded by the Labour Trust and this operation with the materials department at Imperial Commons um, Clay. Um, so what Sarah, Sarah is doing is she's looking at kaolinite, which is um, a clay mineral that comprises of a, a, sh a stacked assembly of what we call silica sheets and gypsite sheets in a single kaolinite particle. So one of these, we think we've got about eight or, eight or 10 of these sheets come together um, to make these particles with a very high aspect ratio. Um, and depending on the pH of the pore fluid or the water around these particles, the different faces and edges of these kaolinite particles can have either positive or negative charges. Um, so we know then um, taking that forward into experiments, so not, there's been a small amount of work done in our lab, the, the lab I showed you a picture of earlier, but quite a lot more work done in Strathclyde, trying to understand how the pH of the fluid around the particles can influence the overall mechanical behavior, such as the strength or more importantly, the stiffness and deformation you might get on a particular load. Um, and so phenomenological, we can see that there's an effect. And what we're trying to do is to see, can we use coarse grain molecular dynamics to predict these phenomena that we see in geotechnical engineering and then be better able to um, um, deal with them at an engineering In um, geotechnical, we're very much wedded to the DLVO theory. Um, which if you work in colloids or have worked colloids, you may be, I actually, I really, I'm coming at this from such a different perspective to I think everyone else on the, on the call that I don't know how well known this is. But these types of pictures um, are in all of our, you know, if you get into any kind of soil mechanics book that to deal with clay chemistry, they show something like this. So we have a plot of our interaction energy, First, some kind of a separation distance, um, and whoops, um, um, and and it, this is a, a theory that comes from the 1950s. It's as I say, it's generally accepted in soil mechanics, but you know, once you start to read into it, 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 it it's it's very much an idealization. But what you see is, um, uh, depending on the surface charge, you have a different energy barrier, and your interactions can either be um, attractive or, or repulsive. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to work out in Sarah's work is, are the pressures that are applied to clay particles and under the kind of engineering stress levels we look at in civil engineering sufficient to cross this energy barrier? Because if we're going to simulate this type of behavior using coarse grain molecular dynamics, that influences the complexity of, of the potential function that we need to use. Um, so what Sarah has been using is she's been following recent work in MIT and applying the Gay-Byrne potential um, and then just calibrating by trial and error um, the parameters of her Gay-Byrne potential um, using LAMPS. Um, if you're not familiar with the Gay-Byrne potential, it's, uh, it's a potential for spherical, or, sorry, for ellipsoidal particles. So by choosing the aspect ratio of your ellipsoid, you can make it look like a you know, like a clay particle, you can say is like a very, very flat ellipsoid that can approach a disc. Um, but what the Gay-Byrne potential can't do is it can't cap, um, capture this non-linearity. Um, and we initially thought, well, maybe under engineering stress levels, we'll always be out here. And this detail of crossing this energy barrier won't be a problem. But it's now become apparent that it is. Um, so we need to look at, in the long term, coming up with a better way to efficiently model these clay particles that ha can have a more nonlinear potential mm -hmm. function. So that's kind of a, a quick introduction to my work on clay. Um, most of what I have done, though, is more looking at sand. Um, so we're looking at particles that are bigger than 60 microns. Um, and there, the ratio of the surface area to volume is small so that the surface charge isn't an issue. So here we're going back more to, uh, to secondary school mechanics that I'll show you in a minute. But the reason we might want to look at this as a fundamental re um, 
in fundamental research again. We're linking into large construction projects. So this is Bennett Dam in British Columbia. Um, and it, at the time it was constructed, I understand it was the largest embankment dam in, in, the, in the US and it holds back the largest reservoir in North America. Um, so if it was to collapse, it would, it would destroy a large number of towns and it would cause havoc in, um, in British Columbia and Canada. So if we look at the dam, what we see is any embankment dam is, is got a configuration something like this. And often I get asked detailed questions about this, this particular design. And this is just a generic kind of schematic of a dam. Any embankment dam will have a clay core that will have a shape something like this, some kind of a quasi-triangular shape. And that clay core is made of low permeability material and that's what's holding back the reservoir. So you can think of this as being like, like your plug. And then to protect that clay core, we have these shells and we have a filter. Um, and during the operation of the dam, water is continuously seeping through the reservoir. But if your clay core is intact, very little water gets through it. And any water that gets through it is picked up by the filter and taken away. So we don't get the build, a buildup of water pressure here, which could um, impede the stability of the dam. And sometime in the mid 90s, some tourists were, were, were driving across the, um, the dam and they noticed the road was a bit bumpy and they reported it. And when the engineers responsible for looking after the dam investigated it, they realized there was a big hole in the dam, um, which obviously is, is really bad news because once you start to get holes, you get concentration of water and you can get surface erosion of particles by this water going through. So this was a major incident. Um, and what had happened is uh, the water going through it eroded some of the material in the filter. And understanding that erosion process is one of the things I've been looking at. I mean, there's other civil engineers are always very good at collecting disaster pictures, unfortunately. But I think most of you will have heard of this um, tailings dam collapse. Last year, it was a very, very big tragedy in Brazil. Um, and there's a lot of effort now ongoing in geotechnics to look at um, the behavior of this type of material. And I'm currently um, trying to get funding for a Chilean student um, through the Chilean government to look at tailings behavior um, at a very fundamental level. And then, um, you know, if you've heard of liquefaction and earthquakes, um, this is a phenomena that happens when soil is very rapidly loading, loaded, it can lose all its strength. So these are the type of problems we're trying to contribute to mitigation against. Um, and sound behavior is very complicated from an engineering mechanic point of view, it's nonlinear. Both the strength and the stiffness are stress level dependent. We get a volume change upon shearing. And all of these phenomena are quite difficult um, to include in a predictive model, and they pose a lot of challenges in engineering design. So what I'm trying to do in my research is use, um, again, molecular dynamics. We do a lot of work with lamps. Um, and a bit of microcomputer tomography to, un to explain um, the particle scale interactions that drive these phenomena that we see and that pose challenges in engineering design. Um, so the way we use um, molecular dynamics, we call it uh, discrete element um, method simulations. So we idealize our sand grains as rigid spheres. Um, um, and they can make and break contact. And at the contact point, we put in um, two orthogonal springs. So molecular dynamics, you think about, as I understand it, always the distance, the separation distance between your centers of your interacting particles. Whereas we look at our overlap and we have a spring, which to some extent, the job is to, to, to make that overlap small. And this overlap can be thought of as the deformation that occurs when two real grains come into contact. And we can use elastic theory to develop expressions for their spring stiffnesses that come very close to mimicking the type of deformation you'd have when two real elastic spheres come into contact. In the tangential direction, we look at friction as well, but in a very simple way, we just say our we will get sliding once our shear force is equal to the product of a coefficient, coefficient of friction times a normal force. Um, so the only, the only thing that's kind of slightly problematic about this in a molecular dynamic sense is we have to maintain a history of our interaction. 
we need to this this um, tangential interaction we, we look at a, a displacement that is cumulative um, so that, that, that makes it slightly tricky to apply some molecular dynamics codes directly to what we're doing. Um, so yeah, that's kind of everything um, about contact. And then the kind of things we're working at at the moment are simulating fluid particle interactions. That ties into those applications I said at the beginning. So one approach is to use what's called coarse grid simulation where we take our CFD cell, which is the cell where we're solving our Navier-Stokes equations, and that's the resolution of the fluid. And we say that's quite a bit bigger than the particles. And this, is, this has gained a lot of traction, particularly in chemical engineering, where they're simulating um, manufacturing processes involved in grains. And in a collaboration I recently had with Bern von Wachum, who's who was in mechanical engineering, who's now moved to Germany, and Daniela Dini, uh, we had a PhD student called Chris Knight, and he was looking just at the, at the assumptions that people make when they're using this type of modeling approach um, by resolving the flow in the pore space between the grains. And what Chris found is that there's quite a big shortcoming to the expressions that people are usually using in these coarse grid approaches to capture the fluid particle interaction force compared to with what the real force is. So one of the areas that we're looking at at the moment is how can we how can we improve this approach to modeling where we're using the, the coarse grained approach and we're looking at maybe using Voronoi tessellations to get better ideas of local porosity um, because we know that the fluid particle interaction force depends on the local porosity. Um, um, I've done a lot of work then on gap graded materials. Um, so looking at situations where you have a mixture of big particles and small particles. These are important because if the small particles have very low stress, such as in this picture here, alpha is a measure of your stress and your fine particles, they can be washed away when, when, when fluid flows through the material. Um, and so one of the things we've been doing is is passing elastic waves yeah, through through the sample and then looking at um, the frequency content of the wave that we pass through the sample um, and, 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 and seeing what frequencies we see present um, at the other end of the sample. So we insert a small elastic disturbance here, we measure it at this end, and we've been looking then at the frequency content of the of the um, the received signal as a way to assess whether or not these finer particles are transmitting stress. And we we've got some pretty useful results from that. This is a collaboration with the University of Tokyo. So these are some tests that were carried out in the University of Tokyo. These are the particles they looked at. And these are pictures of the lamp simulations that were run. And this is showing that as you increase your fines content, the number of fine particles in the sample, at a certain point, you see um, a different um, maximum frequency that can get through the sample. And that's indicating that your, your finer particles are transmitting stress. So um, yeah, that's kind of an overview of the kind of stuff that, that, that I've been doing. And as I say, I, I know it's, it's quite far from what a lot of you are doing, but I think in particular in the area of looking at clay, there, there is some scope for collaboration and overlap, sorry. Great, thanks, Catherine. Uh, so uh, Johannes has a question for you. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Catherine, that was really interesting. And, and part, part of my question you just answered on your last slide, but I was sort of wondering, given that, that you're making these, you know, what, 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 what seems to me like rather drastic approximations to model these systems, I was just wondering how useful is the modeling in the end when you compare to the experiments? Modeling, I, I, I completely, they're very drastic idealizations, but we, if we make this list of these are the things that we struggle to predict in engineering practice, if we make a continuum, like in, in civil engineering, it's, it's finite element analysis is what they're using in industry, um, but they need a constitutive model. And these are the things that are difficult to predict or include in a constitutive model. 
but our model, even if it's just made of spheres, it can predict these phenomena um, sort of over and over again that we, we can capture this type of behavior. But what we can do is we can look at stress states maybe that you can't achieve in the lab. And also by being able to understand the origins of this, we're hoping we can have better, better constructive models. Um, the, the, so that's one aspect. And then in terms of um, the last slide we're trying to do is play around with what we can see in DEM and propose then new experimental techniques. So with this particular study in Tokyo, we, we, we probably see this based on our understanding from DEM simulations. And then they went and, uh, and did some new types of lab tests. So what we're saying is we, could we can um, design new experimental techniques using this insight. Um, and then in the work in gap graded soils, thinking about you know stress different different fractions are under. Here is confirming ideas people in engineering practice have about what's going on in their materials. So you know if you talk to a geotechnical engineer out in the field, a dam engineer, they'll say, oh well, this is what's happening when I do this to my material, but they don't really know. They have an intuition, and so we can either confirm or or show that this intuition isn't quite right, intuitive, intuitive hypothesis. So that's, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, thanks. Sally, you had a comment. Yes, um, I think it's closely related to the one you've just been answering, Catherine. That was a lovely um, overview of the work. It was really striking that your pictures of real systems, um, the sand and the plates of, I think it was feldspar or clay, those shapes are nothing like spheres or even um, very flattened ellipsoids of the gay burn potential. And you've got a variation in size and, and a variation of shape within each sample. Um, yeah. I, I remember when the gay burn potential was very popular for um, liquid crystals. It was just a first attempt of the most computer friendly, cheap way of getting a deviation from a sphere that you could evaluate quickly in mm -hmm. the simulations. Um, and that was a very necessary requirement whereas now for molecular solids we will have atomistic models or all, all atoms there for a lot of the properties do you think that what do you, do you think is the balance between having in your simulations a large number of particles and a very approximate shape or or having a very different shape and more fewer particles and more realism and a different time scales or is this just an area where you'd want to have a whole range of different studies doing different things um so for i, I think you you've hit on a number of the key issues first of all there is a heterogeneity in size so until sarah started doing her work in the literature in geomechanics people have been doing they had used the gay burn potential already. They also were making composite particles where they were gluing spheres together and running coarse grained MV simulations on those. But they used only up to about 5,000 uh, particles. And what we can see is for particles with these very big aspect ratios, you need many more grains before you get an RVE. So that's the first thing. Yeah. You can't, you can't do atomistic simulations and look at a representative number of particles. So where there's a value for the atomistic simulations is sorting this out, getting a better handle on your potential function. And that's what I would like to do if I could get some money, but it just doesn't seem to be that easy to get that funded. I mean, we're using this, this type of assumption that's wrong. Um, and we need, we, need, we, need, we, need, we need some atomistic simulations to, to, handle, to get a better handle on that. In terms the part that's not such a big issue. I mean, we've been using spheres because um, we want to get a representative element volume, and that's really important. And um, also, getting the polydispersity of the shape and getting representative element volume is very, very important. 
where we can start to look at more realistic shapes is by gluing spheres together. I haven't done a lot of work in that area. It's, you know, I did a bit of my PhD and I've gone down a different road, but now we're starting to do that, both with the gay burn potential and with our, our spheres. Because with the gay burn potential, if you want to capture a scenario where maybe this, this, this sheet is positive and this one is, is, is negative, yeah, okay. hmm. you, need to, you need to have two gay burn particles that you effectively mold together. So we're looking at how to do that in lamps and it's, it's, you know, the concept is fine. It's just the logistics of getting lamps to work at scale. Doing that is, it's, you know, that, that's a detail that is kind of not really the science. It's just running the code. And then for the, um, for the sand grains, I mean, one of the things we've done a lot of work on is that, like, this is imaging from one of my PhD students is imaging sand particles, describing the shape and then what we're hoping to do then you can imagine maybe you take a smaller sphere and a bigger sphere and glue them together um, as a rigid body um, that's very doable in a molecular dynamics code um, but yeah I mean you've you've completely um, hit on the issues there um, yeah and that's you know, I think those fundamental DVLO curve simulations they, they are going to be difficult but it, that, that is the sort of fundamentals you need to get out. Yeah, they've, done, the, they've done them in MIT for Montmorillo um, um, And, you know, for that, for the particular scenario they looked at, what was very interesting is, um, and it was Paul that picked up at a Paul Tagney, I hadn't realized it was significant, but they, they had multiple um, kind of local minima in their, in their, in their potential yeah. data. They totally ignored it when they went to their core strain simulations. But Paul thought that was probably important. And the more I look at kind of data for real soil at a macro scale, the more I think he's completely right. That that's probably really, really important. And we, we really don't understand it at all. Um, no. Thank you. So if anyone has like someone they need to entertain with doing optimistic simulations and wants to do this, just let me know.